I'm fine. Two minutes. We got two minutes yet. Well, hey, I want to welcome you tonight. I see some people are still coming in, and that's exciting. I want to welcome those of you online, this emotional resilience, living with the fruit of the Spirit. I'm your host and author, Ron Ovett. We're on Lesson 40. I can't believe that. You know, we go for about 50 uh, and during the year here. We'll be finishing up this summer, and then in the fall, we're going to start over. And I, I tell you, the second year, for many of you, it gets more exciting because a lot of these things are caught more than taught, and I keep adding things so it, it gets fresh and uh, new, and yet you start connecting dots. I know I've done that for myself as I teach it over the years, and uh, I get that testimony from many, many, many people that uh, they're applying it more, they're seeing it more in their life, and I get testimonies all the time of people that share with me some of the things. You know, have you ever ordered pizza and they brought you stuffed pizza instead? You know what stuffed pizza is, right? It's like a pizza, then they put another layer, and they put some more on it, and it's about that thick. Well, tonight we're having stuffed pizza, all right? Uh, so if you came for regular pizza, loosen up a belt buckle, all right? Because we've got a lot for you tonight. And, and here's the thing, you know, I've, I've debated, and I've been accused, I've been accused and probably stand guilty of putting too much in some of these lessons, and I get that. But I really think the onus is on us to go back and relook at some of this stuff. It's like a book, right, in a sense. You can read a book or you can really try to apply the book, right? I mean, we could take a uh, hundred weeks to do the class. I mean, there's, we could stretch this out and it, it would probably be good. But I'd rather teach the 50 weeks and teach it over again because, like I said, you'll, you'll gain as you go along. Now, tonight, we're, we'll probably get through it, because that's the kind of guy I am, right? <laughs> but, but we may not. We'll see. Uh, the, most of it tonight's going to be about what happened in childhood, what are some of the things maybe we learned, uh, we thought about ourselves, and that's where we need to uh, take it back and look at and pray over it and be a little introspective. Because here's the good news. We can change. We can change. Tell the person next to you, things can change, all right? They can. They can change. And uh, there's hope today. Tell them that. Okay, I want to hear a good hope tonight. Come on, tell them there's hope today. All right, that's what I want to hear. You at home, tell the person next, oh, there's no one next to you. Anyway, say it out loud. There's hope today, all right? And there is. There is. You don't have to apply everything, but there might be something that leaps off the page a little bit, and it may get you a little bit emotionally. But here's the good news. We can change. It's not, this isn't a condemnation. It's not a definition. Uh, these are things that might have happened in our childhood that cause us to have certain feelings, certain beliefs. But here's the good news. We're adults now, right? <laughs> you know, I was thinking about that earlier. 
God knew, he, he, he knew that the prefrontal cortex would need to be online around 22, 23. And that means the rest of our adulthood, we can use that rational part of our brain to really redo things. I really believe God designed it that way. He knew that we could rethink these things, reinvent, uh, if you will, ourselves in the way that he wants us to. Next week, Lord willing, we'll be getting into what's it mean to be born again? <laughs> what did Jesus mean about that? And I am excited about that because it applies to what we're talking about here. We become in a whole new family. It's the really, it's the crux of reparenting. And we'll kind of get into that tonight toward the end, if indeed we get that far. So uh, there's a lot tonight to go through, uh, but don't despair. Take it home, look at it, pray over it, and, uh, and we'll just keep moving on because I'm, I'm excited about the whole reparenting concept. We didn't teach that, uh, but the last couple years, for the first 13 years or so, that wasn't part of our curriculum. And I'm so excited about it. I think it's, a, it's something that its time has come. So why don't we pray and we'll get going and, uh, and uh, get into this. So Father, I thank you, Lord, for bringing us here tonight. I thank you for those watching online. I thank you, Lord, that you know all about us. And Father, there is hope today. And Lord, you know the families we've come from. You know the beliefs that we have. You know the things that... Uh, Lord, get us, uh, and Lord, you're able to help us think the right way, to believe the right things, to hope and to uh, tweak our emotions to where they're functioning the way they should. Lord, I thank you that you're not done with us yet, and there's so much ahead of us. And so, Father, I pray for each one here and each one listening and watching tonight that you would speak to our hearts, that you would give us a hope, and Father, we would and in, in be part of this reparenting process and become everything, Lord, that you wanted us to be. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're on part two, how to reparent yourself. Now, what is reparenting? You know, sometimes concepts are hard to grasp. Uh, they can seem too abstract. And when we say reparenting, it can conjure up different things. And, you know, like Nicodemus, when Jesus said, be born again, he goes, what, am I supposed to go back in my mother's womb, you know, uh, because it sounded so literal, right? And, and, and this, in a way, has that literalness to it as well. But we're not talking about going back and being a child again and revisiting our childhood. What we're talk and talking about is finding out those things that we've carried from childhood that might still be immature about the way we think and the way we feel. The new book I'm working on is uh, the, thing, the Lies That We Believe, and I have the be word believe crossed out, feel that are true. Because it's what we feel sometimes that are true, those felt beliefs that trip us up. If I, if I asked you, are you a moron, you would probably say, hey, them's fighting words, right? <laughs> no, I'm not a moron. But I could ask you, have you ever felt like a moron? And there's probably been those times when someone humiliated you or maybe someone called you that, and, and for that tweak of a moment, you kind of felt it, right? You thought, gee, if they said it, maybe it's true. It's not true, okay? But those felt kind of beliefs can trip us up. And so reparenting is a way that we can come back and try to correct those things and realize that, hey, these are products of childhood, these are products, and you'll see how as we go along. I've dug deep and I've put up some stuff from research and things that I think are really relevant, and I decided to bring out, a couple years ago I talked about uh, schema uh, therapy by Jeffrey Young, and I decided to bring it out again because it's, frankly, it's one of the best put together theories I've seen on early childhood. And uh, I think it deserves its props, and so I've brought it back. Unfortunately, you can't find many uh, therapists that are trained in it, uh, but, but that's okay. There's other ways of getting it. So anyways, we talk about the inner child, the inner parts. There's whole therapies out there that talk about working with the inner parts. And, and you know, it's a metaphor when you think about our thoughts, our beliefs, our schemas that are immature. 
A thought or belief can often be corrected by learning something new that makes sense, so we exchange it. And, and there'll be those moments, and maybe tonight even, there'll be something that you thought, well, that's not true. Why did I ever believe that? And boom, right now, you correct that thinking. And that's changed. That was an aha moment. And I trust that some of that will happen, okay? However, deep-rooted self-beliefs can become schemas. And I'm in the second paragraph on one there which serve as a framework, okay? A schema serves as a framework which contain our various beliefs all interconnected, shaping how we see ourselves in the world in which we live. So a schema is a little deeper. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, when you take some of these thoughts that we have, they do create, let's use another word, maybe a worldview. You've heard of the, you know, a worldview. And, and so we want to be able to dig a little deeper and uh, look at them. And Jeffrey Young has created schema therapy that works with 18 male adaptive schemas that are a result of five unmet needs that we have. And like I write here, I have yet to see a more comprehensive list of uh, immature belief systems. So I thought we'd kind of look at those. And hence, this is the stuffed pizza part of the program tonight. But you can take it home, look at it, pray over it, and, and just say, Lord, is there something going on here? Is there something I need to work on? Remember, it doesn't define you. Just because you think something and believe something doesn't mean you have to keep believing that, okay? So we're not looking at definitions here. We're looking at belief systems and schemas. So what are the five core emotional needs? We're right on the middle of page one here. And by the way, those of you at home, if you don't have the notes, you're going to want these. So email me at ron at empowerministry.org. That's ron at empowerministry.org. And say, give me the notes. And I'll put you on our email list so you'll get them each week. Well, number one is secure attachments to others. So that's a need. Now, what does that mean? That means safety, stability, nurturance, and acceptance. Attachment comes out of a childhood. That, that means that we, we have a relationship, attachment's a relationship, a relationship with a significant a parent or caregiver that we feel safe with. And as we go through that childhood, we're able to get farther and farther away and still feel safe because they're not just there they're in our heart. They're with us. Uh, we feel secure with them. And so if something happens, you know, we can go cry to mom, right? Because we know that she'll help. But while we're over here, we feel secure because we've had this secure relationship, okay? And, and that means there's been safety, stability, nurturing, acceptance, and, and, uh, and you'll find that many of us have had acceptance in some areas, but not in others, right? And we've been nurtured in some areas, but in some others we haven't been. And there's been stability sometimes and sometimes other. Maybe safety with one parent, not so much with the other. So it's not always black and white, okay? But it does cause in us to think some things, and we'll look at that in a little bit. The second one is autonomy, competence, and a sense of identity. And so as I separate from the secure attachment, I want to, who am I, right? I'm feeling good being myself. I, I'm able to function knowing that I've had uh, a, a secure attachment that has set in me uh, certain boundaries, certain thoughts, right? And, and uh, the ability to be competent in this sense of who I am. Is it on? Okay. And uh, the third one is the freedom to express valid needs and emotions. And we'll get into that not just here, but we're going to talk about emotional neglect later on in the class. And we'll see that sometimes we weren't able to really express our true emotions. And, uh, and that, can, that can work with us sometimes and cause us to uh, have certain attitudes about ourself and life. And we want to correct that. And then another need is to have unconditional love exhibited in spontaneity and play. Now, what's that mean? A lot of our childhood is being spontaneous and playing. In fact, I heard uh, Dr. Clyde Nairmore, I think, once said, and other psychologists, that the job of a child is to play. <laughs> 
The job of a child is to play. It's through play that they build relationships. It's through play that they learn social rules of engagement. It's through play that they learn creativity and to be able to overcome things. And, uh, and so uh, play is important, spontaneity, but a lot of times that doesn't always play out well at home, <laughs> you know. And so uh, sometimes that, that unconditional love isn't always there. And then realistic limits and self-control, that's another need that we have. And, and some of us may not have had that. There may have been overbearing limits, or there may have been no limits. In, in the case of maybe a parent isn't always there, or isn't always watching or something. And so uh, the male adaptive schemas that result of not having our needs met, and that's where he's talking about. He says we have these four needs, and if they're not met, then we get these male adaptive, these, uh, these non-adaptive uh, ways of thinking that don't work in life so well. And so let's look at the first need. And out of there, there's, I believe, three or is there four? F five. Five of these uh, different kinds of schemas. And so the first need is the need for secure attachments to others. And as we go through this, I want you to look at some of these and ask yourself, hmm, I wonder if some of this played out uh, for me, okay? Okay. Now, the need for secure attachments includes safety, stability, nurturance, and acceptance. And, and if we don't have it, then it results in disconnection and rejection, okay? Now, when we don't have the safety, then we can end up with the following male, male adaptive schemas. End up with the following male, male adaptive schemas. The first one is abandonment instability. The perceived instability or unreliability of those available for support and connection involves the sense that significant others will not be able to continue providing emotional support, connection, strength, or practical protection because they are emotionally unstable and unpredictable. For example, angry outbursts are unreliable or radically present. Because they, will, uh, because they will die intimately or because they will abandon the, pa uh, the person in favor of someone better. You know, not many of us, but some of you may have grown up in, a, in an environment where it just wasn't uh, as secure as it should be. And if that's the case, that can cause us to then have, a, have an abandonment, that things are going to abandon us, okay? The second is mistrust and abuse. The expectations that others will hurt, abuse, humiliate, cheat, lie, manipulate, or take advantage usually involves the perception that the harm is intentional or the result of unjustified and extreme negligence. May include a sense that one always ends up being cheated relative to others or getting the short end of the stick. Now, there's a continuum on these, okay? I mean, obviously, if it's a continuous thing going on, then you're going to have you're going to be skewed to thinking that, hey, you know, I don't know that I can trust people. Uh, I, I'm really skeptical if things are going to go well. Uh, you go into something with your guard up all the time. I walked around with that hyper vigilance. Uh, now, mine wasn't that severe, uh, but it was there. Now, for some, it may be more severe. So there's a continuum, and so when you read this, you may say, hmm. Did I have this kind of uh, relationship with my caregivers or parents? If so, where am I? Third is that if, if indeed that need for secure attachments of safety, stability, nurturance wasn't there, then it may be that there's an emotional deprivation. The expectation that one's desire for a normal degree of emotional support will not be adequately met by others. And there's three different kinds of this deprivation, okay? One is of nurturance. That's the absence of attention, affection, warmth, or companionship. Second is the deprivation of empathy. That's the absence of understanding, listening, self-disclosure, or mutual sharing of feelings of others. And here again, it's a matter of degree, okay? It may not have happened all the time, but you may sense that some of this happened in you, okay? And, and so here's the beauty of this, is that as we see some of these deficits, 
the good news is that as we get reparented in relationships, we can gain some of these. And we'll, we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. The third deprivation on page two there is the absence of strength and direction or guidance from others. And so it may be that you are strong in some but weak in another. It may be that none of these apply to you. It may be that you know some people that it does. So you can acquire some knowledge here and perhaps be able to share it with someone else. The other one that it can cause sometimes is this shame or feeling like I'm defective. I, send, I tended to have this one. Uh, it's the feeling that one is defective, bad, unwanted, inferior, or invalid in important re respects, or that one would be unlovable to significant others if exposed. And you'd be surprised how many of us run around you know, constantly trying to protect ourselves from anyone finding out, you know, whatever that might be, and, and may involve hypersensitivity to criticism, rejection and blame. Has anyone ever said, thicken your skin? <laughs> you know, I, I, a lot of times I would not put myself in a place where I would be evaluated because of this fear of, of rejection, right? Or that, that someone was going to find out that I was defective. And uh, self-consciousness, comparisons, and insecurity, right, around others. Or a sense of shame regarding one's perceived flaws. These flaws may be private, as selfishness, angry impulses, unacceptable sexual desires, or public, undesirable physical appearance, social awkwardness. I mean, that, that's a heavy one, and sometimes... As a result of, of that kind of early childhood, we may get some of these feelings. Maybe not as severe as it's listed here, uh, but perhaps somewhat. And so these, the good news is these things can be corrected. And only, though, if we, if we own some of it, only if we say, hmm, maybe I have felt this way. Hmm, maybe there's sometimes I do think this way. And, and the good news is it's not doesn't have to be a definition. We can change it. The other thing that can happen sometimes as a result of that early childhood need not being met is social isolation or feeling of alienating from others. The feeling that one is isolated from the rest of the world, different from other people, and or not part of a, any group or community. And we see this a lot. You know, you know they do a lot of diagnosis on some of the people that are doing these random shootings and that, and you'd be surprised how many will fit into some of the categories we have here. And, and, not, and not being uh, mentored in a proper way and not having counseling that helps them in that way, things can get out of, out of control. Well, the second need is the need for autonomy, competence, and sense of identity. And right there should say something to yourself. Do I feel that I'm competent? Do I feel like I can make it on my own? Do I have a sense of who I am? And the good news is it's not too late to get those things, okay? But we can go through our life and not be challenged this way. And we're just going down the road and no one ever talks about these things. And, and so the good news is we can change some of these. And so if we don't have that, if we don't have that sense of competence and identity and autonomy as we grew up, then there can be some of these maladaptive schemas or way that we look at life. Number six is dependence or incompetence. A belief that one is unable to handle one's everyday responsibilities in a competent manner without considerable help from others. And so that may be. Now, there's times in life when we all feel that way. But is that, is that a go-to position? Is that, do I not try to do something? You know, that, that's where that set mindset and that growth mindset, right? A set mindset says that, hey, I'm not competent, uh, competent enough to step out of my comfort zone. You know, I don't, I don't feel that I can do it without help from others. A, a growth mindset says, hey, I'm going to step out. If I, if I fail, well, then I'm learning something. Others can help me if they can, but I'm going to step out. I feel good enough about myself. I want to learn. I want to be the best I can be. And so uh, taking care of ourselves, solving daily problems, exercising good judgments, tackling new tasks, making good decisions, 
often this pre uh, presents uh, to helplessness. So the question is, how do we do on those? Are we suffering quietly in those areas? Maybe we got a job or we can do it, but to step out of that comfort zone just freaks us out. We don't feel like we can uh, solve some of those things. And so, uh, you know, you look at that one. Another time, it can cause us vulnerability to harm or illness. And we learned that, right, when we talked about some of the ACEs, right, the uh, uh, childhood, adverse childhood experiences that they can lead to this vulnerability uh, to harm or illness. Exaggerated fear, though, is when that imminent catastrophe will strike at any time and that one will be unable to prevent it. Fears focus on one or more of the following, medical catastrophes like heart attacks, AIDS, emotional cat uh, catastrophes like going crazy, external catastrophes like elevators collapsing, victimized by crinomos, airplanes. How much of that fear do we carry with us? Now, most of us here probably uh, don't, don't suffer that much with some of this, and that's fine, but maybe, maybe you do. I know I've had some of those things, and uh, we need to uh, work on those things. Another one is this enmeshment or undeveloped self, and that's an excessive emotional involvement and closeness with one or more significant others, often parents, at the expense of full individualization, right, or normal social development. So otherwise, I'm just too dependent on them. I don't, I haven't been able to separate. I'm not real good on my own yet. It often involves a belief that at least one of the enmeshed individuals cannot survive or be happy without the constant support of the other. May also include feelings of being smothered by or fused with or uh, others or insufficient uh, individual identity often experiences a feeling of emptiness and floundering, having no direction, or in extreme cases, questioning one's existence. Now, these, here again, these are things that uh, you may not wrestle with, but some of them uh, may, and they may register with you. And then the failure to achieve, it comes out of this need for autonomy, competence, and sense of identity. And that failure means the belief that one has failed, will inevitably fail, or is fundamentally inadequate relative to one's peers in areas of achievement. School, career, sports often involves beliefs that one is stupid, inept, untalented, ignorant, lower in status, less successful than others. There's many people that feel this way. Many people are, are feeling this way uh, because of the lack of the a sense of identity and autonomy that they should have had as a child. Now, here's the good news. We can correct that. That's what reparenting is all about. And if some of these strike a nerve, then what you need to do is say, Lord, I know you're going to help me. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I know you're going to help me in these areas. And that's why we say there's, there's hope today. Well, the need to have freedom to express valid needs and emotions. Now, this one may hit home a little more for some of us because a lot of us were raised in that area that children should be seen and not heard. You know, if you, uh, uh, if you want an opinion, I'll give you one, you know, <laughs> and that, you know, that kind of stuff. And so um, what happens if we don't have those needs are not met and we end up with impaired limits and following man maladaptive schemas? Well, one is, uh, number 10, is entitlement or grandiosity. The belief that one is superior to others, uh, people, entitled to special rights and privileges, are not bound by the rules of reciprocity that guide normal social in, in, in their action. And isn't it interesting, but it often happens when we haven't had that freedom to express our needs, emotions, that we can take a superior stance, and it's it's... It's all make-believe sometimes, but we take that, and, and so uh, often involves insistence that one should be able to do or have whatever one wants, regardless of what is realistic, what others consider reasonable, or the cost to others, or an exaggerated focus on superiority, right? Being among the most successful, famous, or wealthy, uh, so we compensate. And in order to achieve power or control, not primarily for attention or approval, and sometimes includes excessive competitiveness toward or domination of others, asserting one's power, forcing one's point of view, or controlling the behavior of others in line with one's own desires. 
And we've all met people, and sometimes we may have uh, some of these uh, qualifications in our own life where we uh, tend to react this way. And, and it's coming out of uh, this need uh, to have uh, our ability to express ourselves when we were younger. And so we're going to make sure that we're heard later, right? And then there's also an insufficient self-control or self-discipline. Pervasive uh, difficulties or refusal to exercise sufficient self-control and frustration tolerance or achieve one's personal goals or to restrain the excessive expression of one's emotional in, emotions or in impulses. In its milder form, patient presents with an exaggerated emphasis on discomfort, avoidance, avoiding pain, conflict, confrontation, responsibility, or overexertion uh, at the expense of personal fulfillment, commitment, or integrity. Now, let's take a few minutes and look at those that you, so far we're almost done with them. But take a look at the first ones, okay? The need for secure attachment to others, the abandonment, instability, mistrust, right? The emotional deprivation. And then uh, look at, on page two there, defectiveness and shame. And then the need for autonomy, dependence, incompetence, vulnerability or harm, enmeshment there. And then the third one that we just went through. And why don't you take a little table time and, and you may not be you that you want to talk about, but have you seen people or know people? And we don't need to use names or anything like that, but have you experienced people that may uh, have had some of these things? And uh, if so, you know, how has that affected you? Have you suffered with some of these things? Take a few minutes. and Has anything bounced off the page a little bit that you feel comfortable enough to say, you know, I've been working on this, or I, I tend to have some of that, or I know a friend that's had this, and, and uh, I'm going to be sharing how we can get reparented. Take a few minutes and just uh, share at your table, okay? Then we'll come back and finish up those.
Take about another minute, take about another minute, then we'll continue. Let's go ahead and continue here. Now, like I've said earlier, it may be that, you know, as we read this, you got to remember these definitions include severe cases, right, and, and, and a, a tremendous uh, need in a person's life. It may be that you're somewhere, you know, if it was a continuum, you're, you're way up here. But take from these things anything that you feel that you need to work on. That's why I'm doing this. Because there are, this next one, for example, is something that I've wrestled with and have needed to work on, this need for unconditional love accept, accepted in spontaneity and play. Uh, there were reasons that I, I, later on in life, figured out that I felt I was unlovable and needed to work on that. And a lot of that ended up in this. When, then, when uh, there is a lack of unconditional love and squelching of spontaneity and play, you can end up being... Uh, other person or persons directed. That's an interesting concept, persons directed, other persons directed, living with the following male adaptive. The first is subjugation, right? Now, that's a fancy word for meaning subject to someone else, right? Excessive surrendering of control to other people, others because one feels coerced, usually to avoid anger, retaliation, or abandonment. Uh, have you ever had the difficulty of uh, saying no to people? Are you that go-to person that everyone counts on? Uh, you get the call at midnight and go out and do something uh, for the person? I know someone that does that kind of stuff. <laughs> Anyways, all right. Uh, two major forms are subjugation of needs, suppressions of one's preferences, decisions, and desires. Second is subjugation of emotions. Suppression of emotional expression, especially anger, usually involves the perception that one's own desires, opinions, and feelings are not valid or important to others. Frequently present as excessive compliance combined with hypersensitivity to feeling trapped. Generally leads to buildup of anger, manifested maladaptive symptoms, that passive aggressive, I had to work on that myself, uncontrolled outbursts of temper, Psychosomatic symptoms, right? We, we know that a lot of that happens. Uh, withdrawal of affection, acting out, and of course, substance abuse. And this, a lot of people suffer, that, and I find that sometimes in the church. Uh, we're taught, right, self-denial. I mean, we're taught to be like Jesus, right, and self-denial. And I remember a counselor telling me, he said, Ron, you don't have self-denial. You have self-annihilation. <laughs> you don't have a self. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I needed to work on that. And uh, I remember the first time I saw the book Boundaries, I was thinking, what is this about? What do you mean I can set up boundaries? How can we have boundaries? We're supposed to love and serve everyone, right? I mean, I was in it hook, line, and sinker. And another way it shows sometimes is self-sacrifice. And, and, and let me say, the ones that paid the price wasn't me. It was my family, right? Uh, my wife and my children, when I would be so busy, couldn't even go on vacations, or when I was always uh, helping other people and, and at the expense of my own family. And I've tried over the years to correct that but, and, uh, and try to correct the damage that was done. But a lot of times we get trapped into that. Self-sacrifice is another one. Excessive focus on voluntarily meeting the needs of others in daily situations at the expense of one's own gratification. The most common reasons are to prevent causing pain to others, to avoid guilt from feeling selfish, 
or to maintain the connection with others perceived as needy, often results from an acute sensitivity to the pain of others. Uh, some, and that happens in childhood a lot of times. You become very aware of the needs. If you've had a parent that had uh, some emotional issues and you were trying to meet their needs, you, you, you get a radar and you sense this stuff and that rescuing and that codependency and stuff like that can raise its head. And um, let's see, often results from acute sensitivity to the pain of others sometimes leads to a sense that one's own needs are not being adequately met and to resentment of those who are taken care of and overlaps with that uh, concept of codependency. Fourteen is approval seeking or recognition seeking. Excessive emphasis on gaining approval, recognition, or attention from other people or fitting in at the expense of developing a secure and true sense of oneself. One's sense of esteem is dependent primarily on the reaction of others rather than one's own natural inclinations. Now that's a hard one. That may be uh, some of you here, and if so, it's hard to acknowledge this because we want to fit in so bad. And, and there's something in us that feels we're not good enough. And that can, some of these things can hurt when we get in touch with them. But that's okay. It's okay. We're not going to die if we get in touch with uh, how we felt as a child. Because the good news is we can change these things, okay? But you can't change what you don't recognize. You can't change what you don't decide to change. And so, um, you know. Sometimes it leads to a sense that one's own needs are not being met at the resentment of those they're taking care of. Another one is approval seeking, recognition seeking, excessive emphasis on gaining approval, recognition or attention from other people or fitting in at the expense of developing a secure and true sense of self. One's sense of esteem is dependent primarily on the reaction of others rather than on one's own natural inclinations. Sometimes includes an overemphasis on status, appearance, social acceptance, money, or achievement as means of gaining approval, admiration, or attention, not primarily necessarily for the power or control. Frequently results in major life decisions that are inauthentic or unsatisfying or in hypersensitivity to rejection. And then the last one is this need for realistic limits and self-control. Now, you've got, got to remember, these are needs. And the good news is we can have these needs fulfilled today as we develop new relationships, as we develop new healthy relationships, and as we seek those kind, and as we be that for other people, we'll find a lot of times it's reciprocal. Well, when you don't have realistic limits, you can base your self-worth, spelt that wrong, self-worth on opinions of others. Uh, this results in approval seeking and recognition seeking. This is lived out with the following schemas. 15, negativity and pessimism. A pervasive lifelong focus on the negative aspects of life, pain, death, loss, disappointment, conflict, guilt, resentment, unresolved problems, potential mistakes, betrayal, anything that could go wrong. And we've all met people that are pessimistic and uh, don't have the optimism. And, and there may be certain times in our life when we've been that way or certain ways. And while minimizing or neglecting the positive or optimistic aspects usually includes, you know, usually it includes an exaggerated expectation in a wide range of work, financial, and interpersonal situations that things will eventually go seriously wrong or that aspects of one's life that seem to be going well will ultimately fall apart. You wake up that uh, way sometimes where you can't, you know, yeah, it's been going good, but I don't know how long this is going to last, you know. And that dead gloom comes over you and all of a sudden start to think uh, negatively. You know, it, it uh, usually involves an inordinate fear of making mistakes that might lead to financial collapse, loss, humiliation, or being trapped in a bad situation. Because potential negative outcomes are exaggerated, these, these people are frequently characterized by chronic worry, vigilance, complaining, or indecision. And you can circle that last part of that sentence and ask yourself, where do I fall on that? Where do I need, Lord, to improve, perhaps? Another way it shows itself up sometimes is emotional inhibition. 
And that's the excessive inhibition of spontaneous action, feeling, or communication, usually to avoid disapproval by others, feeling of shame or losing control of one's impulses. You've ever felt that way? You've been in a group and people, you know, are supposed to speak and you're holding back. Maybe you're not saying anything, you don't know, and you have this inhibition sometimes. And when you dig deeper, it might be that, well, I don't know, what are they going to think? And you're thinking, what are they going to think if I say this? And, you know, so that may be something that we need to work on. The most common areas of inhibition involve inhibition of anger and aggression, inhibition of positive impulses, joy, affection, sexual excitement, and play, difficulty expressing vulnerability or communicating freely about one's feelings or needs. You know, you can circle those. That, a lot of us uh, suffer with some of this stuff, and we need to pray and say, Lord, help me find a balance, right? And then C, difficulty expressing, well, I already said that. And then D, excessive emphasis on rationality while disregarding emotions. And then 17, unrelenting standards or hypercriticalness. This could be another reaction uh, if, you know, that, if that need for realistic limits and self-control wasn't there. The underlying belief that one must strive to meet very high internalized standards of behavior and performance, usually to avoid criticism typically results in feelings of pressure or difficulty slowing down and in a hypercriticalness towards oneself and others, must involve significant impairment in pleasure, relaxation, health, self-esteem, sense of accomplishment, or satisfying relationships. Unrelenting standards typically present as perfectionism, that's an inordinate attention to detail or underestimate of how good one's own performance is relative to the norm. Uh, B, rigid rules and shoulds in many areas of life, including unrealistically high moral, ethical, cultural, or religious precepts. Or preoccupation with time and efficiency uh, so that more can be accomplished. And so there's some, there's some heavy duty things here that, that we might need to work on. And the good news is we can do that as we start to feel the freedom to be ourselves, to be with people that love us and care for us, to have, a, you know, to drop maybe some of those toxic relationships. And then as we discover next week, uh, ha having the kind of relationship with God that supports a lot of these things. And then the last one is punitiveness. The belief that people should be harshly punished for making mistakes involves the tendency to be angry, intolerant, punitive, and impatient with those people, including yourself, who do not meet one's expectation or standards. It usually includes difficulty forgiving mistakes in oneself or others because of a reluctance to consider extenuating circumstances, allow for human perfection, or emphasize with feelings. Now, in schema therapy, they place a great emphasis on emotional needs and attachment in interpersonal relationship. And they do a lot of their stuff through therapy, through a relationship with a therapist that has that unconditional love. So in a sense, they're reparenting. It's a longer involved type of therapy. And a lot of therapy has gone that way. I believe we can have those relationships with few people that can help us in similar ways. And, and uh, we can have that kind of thing as we have the kind of relationships. I believe the church of all uh, places could be and should be a place where there's acceptance and love and the ability to be ourselves and the grace allowed to be that. Uh, so many times we don't feel that there's that grace to be who we are. And, and uh, a lot of this is coming out of that here. And so uh, you can look up more on that. I put that there. Take a look then at those, okay, the rest of them. You looked at the first half. Go ahead and take a look at the second half there and, uh, and see if there's any ones that uh, might have, uh, you know, 12 through 18, I think it was. See if any of those uh, you've wrestled with or know some people they have and uh, have experienced it from others. Take a few minutes and go over that.
got one more minute. All right, well, let's continue, all right? You know, I don't know why I get worried up here sometimes that, you know, going through this stuff, boy, this is kind of heavy, you know, I'd rather be talking about ice cream or something, you know. But, uh, you know, <laughs> we'd rather be eating ice cream, right? You know? <laughs> but here's the thing. If reparenting is a concept you don't grasp uh, yet, hopefully you will by the time we're done with this series, that's fine. But the need to mature in certain areas and, and the, the thing is, we can go through life knowing that things aren't working out the way they should, knowing that we're having difficulties, knowing that we're having problems, and yet not stop to realize why or what's going on, and, and that we're not challenged then to really do some of the work that we need to do. And the good news is, we can do this kind of work. And so part of what I'm trying to do is, is give you some of the best I've found out there that kind of point out that there may have been some things in childhood that have caused certain reactions in our lives, that have caused us to have certain attitudes, certain behavior styles, and that's okay. Because once we know it, we can work on it. Now, there's another person that's done some groundbreaking work, and it's, it's getting more popular now, but uh, is the next example here, uh, emotional neglect on the top of page five. Another form of childhood trauma is emotional neglect, and we'll discuss this at the tables in a few minutes. It's not discussed much. Childhood emotional neglect occurs when your parents under-attend, under-respond, and under-validate your feelings throughout your upbringing. You see, most of the times we talk about different kinds of abuse, right? But sometimes there's an emotional, and, and uh, uh, it can cause certain things. So Dr. Janice uh, Webb has written a book called Running on Empty, and then she has a second one, I think Running on Empty No More or something like that. And uh, she defines emotional neglect as something you didn't receive as a child or that you did receive as a child. You didn't receive the emotions you need, the emotional attention, the validation, and the education that you need emotionally. And she wrote an article and introduced two ways emotional neglect can rear its head, passively and actively. And so we want to look at those, because I thought it was uh, pretty good. It's not necessarily a summation of her books, but it certainly does uh, give a good handle. Number one, parents don't seem to notice when their child is upset, angry, confused, or anxious. And so if that happens a lot, what is our takeaway as a child? Our takeaway is that we learn that our feelings are unimportant. And I, having you know, been in counseling, working with children, and I started out in play therapy and that, I've seen situations where uh, this has happened. And, uh, and pretty soon you learn that, you know, just buck up, right? You know, uh, don't worry about it, you know, come on. You know, you know the emotions aren't that important, right? And then two, conversations in a family are superficial and lack substance. Whenever there's a conflict or disagreements, the family goes to great lengths to avoid the discomfort that is, that is sharing feelings. 
And we talked about some of that last week, and I encourage you, if you didn't get last week's notes, to get them and look at these things in combination. The takeaway there is that you learn that talking about deeper topics is uncomfortable and should be avoided. Uh, you never get a chance to learn how to effectively communicate or articulate how you feel or what you need. And you'd be surprised how many families are this way. You couldn't really talk about it, especially as a, a younger person, right? And then three, when chi a child expresses anger, parents may be disappointed, disapproving, or even separate themselves from the child. The takeaway, you learn that anger is a bad emotion that is to be kept inside and that anger repels others. Now, that doesn't mean that the parents should just let them explode, but there's a proper way to express anger, and we can encourage children to do that. I appreciate that you're angry. I appreciate that you're upset, uh, but let's talk about that. And you, you, you show them boundaries on it, right? Four, if a child ma makes a mistake or chooses poorly, they are left to figure out what to do on their own without guidance or support. And, and some of us may have felt that way. You know, we just didn't know what to do. We didn't get help maybe with our homework. We didn't get help in certain things. We were left to figure this out on our own or maybe, you know, with our peers. And the take takeaway sometimes is you're not given the chance to learn from your mistakes. It's your parents' job to talk you through a poor decision and help you learn from it and how to move forward or choose differently next time. Uh, that's what discipline's about, right? So many times we go into punishment and where discipline is really about the future. Punishment's the past. But discipline is saying, listen, I want you to learn from this so next time uh, you can do. And so uh, we want to learn from those things. If this is properly modeled, you can eventually do this independently. Without learning this skill, you may instead develop a harsh inner critic that beats you down every time you make a mistake right in the future. And many of us have that kind of inner critic where we do berate ourselves when we make mistakes. And man, if, we, if that thing was in a megaphone, <laughs> we'd be surprised and shocked uh, how, how we talk to ourselves sometimes. And a child, five, a child dealing with bu bullies at school has to keep it to himself, knowing his parents would not be helpful. Uh, I remember uh, coming home and complaining about that and being ridiculed about it, you know, being called a sissy and what the, why didn't I do this and that kind of stuff. And uh, darn if I decided not to tell anyone about that kind of stuff again, right? The takeaway is you learn you are alone in the world and cannot rely on others for support. Now, you may notice from these examples that passive emotional neglect lurks beneath the surface. It's not that your parents did something to you. It's that they didn't do the things you needed them to do. And this is why you may have difficulty identifying examples from your own childhood. Now, here again, I, I always try to qualify this by saying, listen, this isn't about parent bashing. There's no perfect parents. Ask my children. <laughs> you know, there's no perfect parents. And they do the best they can. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't acknowledge that maybe something happened that we need to work on because we want to improve, right? Now, there are some active emotional neglect. But before we go on to that one, why don't you look at those first, the passive ones, at the table there. And do you recognize any of these? Have you seen any of these in your life or in the life of others? And as soon as you do that, let's take a break. And there's a beverage and uh, snacks in the back. The bathrooms are around the corner. Go out the door, turn left, and the bathrooms are on the other side. And uh, let's come back at uh, probably eight minutes after. But take a few minutes and see if any of those at your table go ahead and talk that you've seen in your life or maybe the life of others.
When you're done at the table, uh, go ahead and take a break. Come back at 10 after. I'll give you a few more minutes. Uh, but go ahead and finish at the tables if you want, but then uh, come back at 10 after, okay?
All right, about one more minute. We'll be coming back in. One more minute. Grab you some here. We're going to, I can tell you right now, we're not going to get done with all of it. I'm going to share uh, next week. I got a good place here where we'll stop. I feel real comfortable about it. And so about one more minute. Whoops, there's 810 now. So, <laughs> all right, so as soon as they get back in, we'll go ahead and continue. Those of you at home, if you don't have the notes, uh, you know, write me, ron at empowerministry.org. I'll be happy to send them to you. Uh, many of you do get the notes, so, and that's good. Uh, I'll, I'm going to break this off, and I'll be sending you a new copy for next week uh, where we'll uh, have it. I'm going to extend this a lesson because I think it deserves it. <laughs> All right. Well, let's continue, okay? All right. Now, there's some active emotional neglect, okay? Um, when a child expresses an emotion, they may be met by degrading responses like, you're too emotional. Don't be such a drama queen. The takeaway is you learn that it is weak to feel, and in order to be strong, you need to be emotionless. And you'll be surprised how many, you know, parents work hard. You know, you come home at the end of the day, and all of a sudden it's, boy, and, and if you got more than one kid, right, you got two or three of them, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, whack-a-mole, right? One quiets down, and the next one pops its head up. And it can really get tiring. And parenting is very, very hard. And, uh, but we need, you know, if, if you heard a lot of this, here again, we'll, uh, we need to say, admit it and say, hey, we need to work on this. Second is parents attempt to override their child's feelings by having bigger, stronger emotions. And I, uh, I remember feeling that way sometimes as a parent, too. Um, and that article continues, that's crazy. Anyways, the takeaway, uh, you learn that you are responsible for the feelings of others. Your parents may respond to your angry feelings by saying, if you don't want me to be mad, you better stop being angry. <laughs> and, uh, or to your sad feelings, you have no idea what real pain is, right? And this makes your feelings seem threatening or insignificant, and you keep your feelings inside for fear that they'll upset others. And, and you'll be surprised. You've got to catch yourself. You know, part of what we're talking about in emotional resilience, and actually that's what we're going to split off and do next week. We're going to look at emotional resilience again. Part of it is this recognition. And we need to start catching ourselves uh, on some of these things, okay? Uh, third is when a child expresses anger, they're punished. And I, 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 I know that, right? The takeaway, though, sometimes is you learn that your anger is offensive and wrong. Now, sometimes the way we behave when we're angry may be inappropriate, okay? And that needs to be dealt with. But if we're, if we're dealing with the anger itself, if that's what's being communicated, uh, then sometimes that can send the wrong message. And uh, like I was saying earlier, one of my favorite ones is, okay, I can appreciate that you're angry, okay, but we, we got to deal with that a little differently. What is it that you're angry about? You know, and you start, you try to get a little dialogue. Now, they may be too angry to deal with it then. Let's calm down, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes, you know, but you can't, you can't act inappropriately. And so you can, uh, you know, there's ways of doing that. A child knows then that, hey, they've got anger, but they're learning now that uh, they can deal with it. Uh, fourth, a child seeking emotional support or guidance may be bet, met with rea uh, rejecting parents that label the child as needy or even pathetic. And I can't tell you how many times I've been in a store or a mall and a kid's acting out and what comes out of the parent's mouth sometimes. And then maybe they're frustrated or whatever, but I, because I'm sensitive to this stuff and study this stuff, I've heard all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't take a lot to squelch a child to stop a child from acting out. Anger is one way, put downs is another, ridicule and humiliation is another, and, and threatening is another. And unfortunately, sometimes parents, we do that kind of stuff because it's effective. <laughs> and we're not going into it thinking that there's a long-term effect. But the trouble is we get into habits and patterns and we do what seems to work and then we don't think of the consequences. And so, so I don't, this isn't about judging parents, it's more about us. Are we reacting because of this? Do we need to change some things? Do we need to reparent ourselves and realize and have a better view on our own emotional makeup? 
okay? Uh, the takeaway there would be you learn that having needs is unacceptable, and that's not true, you see? These are some of the lies that we believe. This is why we're talking about, you know, what's the truth? This is part of that emotional relearning because these things are emotionally learned. And emotional learning isn't overcome just by knowing something differently. That's why, I, you know, we're taking the time on this because if all you do is read this, you're not gonna, it's not going to be applied. It's in the application. It's in the knowing it. It's in the feeling it. It's in the remembering circumstances and knowing that it can be different. That's where change comes from as we emotionally relearn. And uh, the takeaway, a child seeking, uh, yeah, a seeking emotional support or guidance that may be met with rejecting parents that label them a needy of pathetic. The takeaways you learn that having needs is unacceptable. You may begin to believe that expressing your feeling, the foundation of who you are, will lead to rejection. I know I've wrestled with that. Uh, much of my life, right? And each time a child displays an emotion that is not positive, they're sent to their room. Now, there's a difference between inappropriate behavior and having an emotion. And a lot of times we have to take action against inappropriate behavior, but we don't have to reject the emotion with it. We need to, we need to hear the emotion, model a better way of doing it, and then a discipline for the behavior that was inappropriate. Does that make sense? You see what I'm saying? And, and, but a lot of times it's just blow up at the behavior and the emotion, and, and the child doesn't go away just thinking the behavior was wrong. They think the emotion was. You learn that your negative emotions are bad and should not be tolerated or expressed to others. In fact, you may be punished for them. Now, Dr. Webb concludes, whether you experience passive childhood emotional neglect, active childhood emotional invalidation, or both, the message you took away from your childhood may have a lasting impact on who you are today. So take a look at those and at your table and ask yourself, you know, have you ever experienced any of those? Or maybe you know someone that has. Uh, have you seen real life examples of this kind of stuff, okay? And let me just say, the reason we're doing this table talk is where some of us may be having some of this and thinking we're all alone. We're the only ones with this kind of stuff. We need to know that this stuff is more common than we think. Uh, that uh, many, many people, many, many, many people uh, have uh, skewed emotions, skewed expressions because of this. So go ahead and share at the table, all right?
All right, let's go to the bottom of page six, okay, and we'll wrap it up. The answer for childhood trauma is being reparented. And this is your homework now for the week, uh, the next uh, two paragraphs here. I want you to kind of think about it. Of course, obviously, no one's going to check up on you. But if you really want to grasp what's going on, you want to see some change, uh, he here's what we can do. What we do we need to begin the process of being reparented? Okay, and next week we'll talk about uh, the resilience. How can we be resilient? We're going to go over... Uh, uh, 12 Steps to Reparenting, which is really exciting. We'll unpack that. There was a whole book written on that, which follows the kind of 12 steps, and that will then lead us into the week following where we're going to talk about how do we become reparented by God and what's he have to do uh, with that. And so, first of all, recognize that the parenting you had may not have been the model it should have been. And uh, second, write down some of the negative things and some of the how to earn love rules. Now, I've given you a whole bunch of scenarios tonight. Uh, you can kind of go back through and see if any of those things apply to you. Uh, and, and it may be that you need to grieve the fact that maybe it, it wasn't what it should have been. And that's okay. That's, uh, grieving is a, is a good process. It's acknowledging it, it's, it's, it's having some remorse, but then we move through that stage of grief into acceptance and then into what? Adaption, where we're going to adapt and we're going to be reparented. And, and part of that is forgiving the past and accepting the future. And then I think as we go along, uh, we're going to be talking more about let, let God help you write some of the new rules. What do you need to be thinking and believing instead of these things? And you need new rules in order to accept being reparented. And I've given you some here to think about uh, that you might want to meditate uh, on this week. And that is, I am free to be loved. And that I was created lovable. And some of these may stick they, in, in your craw and you don't quite understand them. They don't compute and that's okay. Meditate on them. Ask God, Lord, help me. Visualize them. What would it feel like to believe that? What would it look like for me to feel that way? How would I react around other people if I felt that way? Sense what that feels like. I was created lovable. I, can, I know I can be forgiven by God for whatever I've done. Four, I was not born in shame. It was put upon me. I throw it off. I don't have to have this sense of shame if I'm going around with that. Uh, five, we'll talk about this more when we talk about uh, uh, God in, in, in the whole reparenting thing. I'm a new creature in Christ, right? I'm, I'm in a new family. I have a new father, right? And then God loves me so I can love myself. And that's something, you know, do I adequately love myself? Do I have that expression? Then I choose to accept love, forgiveness, and freedom. And, and so, you know, think on some of those things. Go through that. If you need to write one or two of them out and just meditate on it this week, uh, ask God to speak to your heart. Start seeing how this fits. See how comfortable you are with some of them. Uncomfortableness doesn't mean it's not true. <laughs> It means you're having a hard time believing it's true, okay, and feeling that it's true. Remember, we're fighting these felt beliefs, and uh, so uh, that's, that's what we're going to go next week. We'll take, I'll redo the, uh, the paper where next week this, the rest of this lesson and some other will be part of pay, uh, lesson 41. So that's a lot to unpack tonight. I think it's given us some food for thought. It's given us some needs of why we might need to be reparented. And that's the good news. No matter how old we are, we can learn some of these things. So let's just give this process back to God and ask him to just continue to move in each one of our lives. Okay, so Father, I thank you, Lord. Tonight we took a look at some things, Father, that maybe came out of our childhood, that Lord have set our sails in certain directions that have caused us to believe certain things, caused us to react in certain ways. And perhaps tonight, Lord, you've spoken to our hearts a little bit. And perhaps tonight we've seen some things, Lord, and we're not sure necessarily what to do with them, but they're there. And, 
And Lord, help us examine them. Help us to see them, Lord. Help us to know, uh, Lord, if there's any lies we're believing about ourselves. Lord, help us to know the truth of how lovable we are, Lord, how you, uh, Lord, you care for us so much. And help us, Lord, in this whole reparenting process of those things that we might need to learn afresh. So, Lord, continue to work in us. Thank you for bringing us together. Watch over us this week. Bring us back together next week, Lord willing. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good job. You did good tonight. Thanks so much, huh? Good job.